Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am delighted to be back with uh, podcast number 17 on my latest uh, book, which is called Six Beat Sonnet Treats. And I'm going to be... Uh, let me just adjust the screen. There we are. That's a little better. I am going to be um, uh, giving you a sample of them, and that's the basic way uh, you can approach the entire volume. I intended, when I wrote it, to have a kind of ultimate browser book. There are 40, 400 poems in this book, and uh, you can just go all the way through anywhere, Find anything you like, but because that is really the point. The point of this book is probably most of you have at some time or other come across a poem called a sonnet. A sonnet means a 14-liner, and maybe the one you heard, the chances are good, might have been this. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Nothing wrong with that. In fact, nothing better. But it isn't the only best. How about writing in sixes? Je suis belle au mortel comme rêve de pierre. And one and two and three and four and five and six and... Now who did that? That's Charles Baudelaire. I might have quoted something from Victor Hugo. And all of that would have enabled me to uh, uh, make my main point, which is the French have done them. Why haven't the English done the same very entertaining kind of poetic writing writing in sixes so six beats sonnet treats uh, is a collection entitled to show you can do anything let me just start with something that is expressive of the pure joy of writing in this mode it's called responder I will reply in sound to what I'm lent in light I will reply in word to world a bursting bold. I answer in a meter to my heartbeat might. I answer with a clamor the command of old. And when the bolt of Thor is lifted, I respond, and when the stormy horde is roaring, I reply, and if at dawn the rain, a riddle whisper fond, I answer in a soft susurral to the sky. My summer psalm, another that with sun ray strove, my springtime singing, and my fall exulting, all our spry incitement that the fiery titan drove in thunder down and up from underworld, a call of sun that hovered on the water but requires immersion, merger, climbing from the floods or fires. I'm thinking of uh, uh, Vulcan, who was sentenced to be underneath that volcano, and every now and then he um, has a temper fit, and we get a quite a lava shower. Uh, so the, the sun seems to rise from the water in the morning, and the fire seems to rise from the mountain whenever it likes. That's the whole point, doing whatever you like in poetry, expressing it to every emotion in every situation. There are little riddles, though, also in some of my poems, and this contains one. Uh, listen to this. My summer psalm, another that with sun rays drove. What was the first one? The first one was a poem by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, the author of Faust, Germany's greatest poem by Germany's greatest poet, where he says, Und da duftet's wie vor Alters, da wir noch von Liebe litten, und die Seiten meines Psalters mit dem Morgenstrahl sich stritten. That means it smells here just the way it did when we visited last, uh, before we suffered from love. And my, die Seiten meines Psalters, the strings of my psaltery, which is a folk harp, strove with the rays of the morning.
strove, uh, used to mean struggled. So that you see that when I say my summer psalm, another that with sun rays strove. There are too many people that are, uh, uh, may figure that out, but uh, that's okay. I just love riddles. I like to disclose. I like to clarify. I was a teacher for 35 years at, at uh, Binghamton University, but I also like to hide and play hide and seek. So that's the first poem I'd like to share with you. Let me try another. Oh, yes. Here I'd like to show in this poem, this is 232, that is called Turkish. In this poem, I want to show you how, uh, let's say, uh, coronavirus is bothering you and you're trying to figure out how to order groceries on the computer. Push the wrong key and you're in trouble. That's what I wrote my poem about. I needed instant. Coffee grounds I got instead. When I on internet a label had misread, I asked the shrewd computer, tell me what to do. And she replied, the simplest option now for you is make your coffee just the way you did before. Pretend the grounds are instant. Let the water pour and call it Turkish coffee. Wait a little while. The grounds will settle down. you like the novel style. Can milk fit in? I type and learn that though the Turks will tell you no, the milk idea's fine. It works for me, a lady in Slovenia volunteers. I drank it milky and I liked it many years, though I was chided in a Turkish restaurant. Slovenians, we, our independence, let us vaunt. Well, isn't that fun? You just take a little trouble you're having in your life and turn it into a bit of entertainment. Um, I do that throughout the coronavirus period to give myself a little amusement. Here's another example of how that can be done. In poem 50, I talk about something that you've all experienced increasingly lately, and that is... The likelihood that since you're not going outside, or not too likely to be going outside, uh, you may be wearing pajamas. Suddenly I thought, why don't I write about pajamas? And it turned out, after I Googled the idea, that in fact I hadn't known anything about them, and I, glad, I was glad to give myself a little education. Here we go. Pajamas. Subcontinental Asia, fashion granted, had, which widely spread, and I, in Vestal Town, am glad. For Muslim, Sikh, or Hindu, waking or asleep, to a body comfortable, rested, peaceful, keep. The very colored striping, orderly, subdued, has lent the uniform a firm, symmetric mood. The top and bottom, as in formal suit, agree in this a confident propriety to see. The folded over shirt front placket will provide protection from the plastic button shapes to add the styling of the cuffs a bit of elegance may furnish that the total pattern can enhance. Why write on such a thing? Montaigne, and he's not mad, of gallstones even wrote, and wisdom lent beside. That's kind of fun to think about. Montaigne, uh, back in 1500s, was inventing the modern essay. He actually used the word essay in French, which means an attempt. Uh, you essay something means you're trying it out. And uh, he d did write about everything under the sun. His s object of study was himself, and that means a whole lot is not left out, hmm? including gallstones, which uh, were a terrible thing. Well, now we go on. What are we going on to? I'll read my last uh, explicitly COVID poem. This is a fun poem because in it I invented a new word. I looked at the word COVID. And suddenly it occurred to me, I add a few letters and I get Neo-Latin, Covideamus. That means, let us see. Let us see. 
We've learned a lot, actually, from this Let Us See idea through the COVID-19 era. And here we go. The COVID plague brings death. But when we scrutinize the word in fancy, hopeful gleam can meet the eyes. Upon the name of it, a Neo-Latin word I built to serve as motto. Let it then be heard. Covideamus, or together let us see. It does mean together let us see. That's the co in front. We may envision futures. Brave camaraderie is viewed right now when to New York from China sail. Protective gear and helpful aid, thus friends avail. Our nation's leader clouds the air with viral lies. No needed masks providing, he the need denies. But governors and doctors, that which we require, provide, for they collaborate. They truth desire. Covideamus colloquies. I hear the call. Let's work at health together. Medicare for all. Okay, now we go to, uh, oh, something has nothing to do with politics, but which is very, very personal. This actually happened to me and I was utterly astonished. It's called Greyhound. The play was over. Tracy Letts is Killer Joe. I thanked the actors all. Then down the street I'd go, where near the Greyhound station, taxis often wait. But somehow, freezing night, it seemed too cold, too late. A kindly cop I met, who called a cab for me, a man whom she'd be taking to the shelter, She's so helpful to us all. When hearing my address, asked, maybe drop him off? I can't, but nonetheless, I heard their further talk. So, do they come to you quite often? Thoughts of suicide? My days are through. I say, God, take my life. Outside or in a bed? Next morning, I am really mad, because I'm not dead. The cab drew near. I cried, quite helpless, heavy, sad. I wish you every happiness that can be had. We need something a little calmer. I'm going to read a poem called Ladder. This is a fascinating thing, and it exemplifies one of the things in cultural history that I love the most, and that is when traditions get together. No, no wall building, but together making. And in this case, a rabbi from the West Coast, uh, who had had a, a lots, lots of contact with Buddhists and, and Zen practitioners, suddenly realized one day when he was reading the story of Jacob Jacob's dream concerning the angels walking up and down the ladder, ladder from earth to heaven and back again, he realized that could be re regarded as a portrait of a mind in meditation. What are you looking at? The angels up and down the ladder are the rise and fall of your feelings, your impulses, your thoughts, your conclusions, your questions. You watch them. And you're distanced from them. The mind is not the same thing as the brain. I had to write that up in my own way. So this is called Ladder, after reading Alan Liu's book called Be Still and Get Going. The angels on the ladder Jacob viewed in dream that up and down arose and fell are endlessly by what is changing in our nature lent that we may these, our thoughts, our feelings, heed and hear and see and enter and let go and know and as they teem let pass unfixed, unfettered and unfeared let flee, not hold and therefore not be 
held, becoming free of past imaginings, to welcome in the stream of energies that won't enchain but overwhelm in awe that, bravely facing, we may mastery attain, to see that part of us which from the realm of shadows had arisen, turning to the gleam of I will be as I will be. The angel flame that later to the meditator Moses came. Oh. Now I turn to a different tradition. I like to turn to all sorts of traditions. And in this one, I am going to Islamic legacies. Uh, the epigraph, what set me off, is the following. I was a hidden treasure and wanted to be known. That doesn't come from the Quran, but from the uh, Hadith writing. The Hadith writings are memoir narratives uh, by the Prophet Muhammad's uh, disciples, friends, relatives, colleagues. So, here's what I derived from that sentence, which quite struck me. I was a hidden treasure wanting to be known. The Sufi quester quotes the ultimate. I've grown more self-aware in each created work well made. The cleaver of the daybreak will his wealth unlaid with light which both illumines and creates the view. We're all unmanifest, the Lord and mortals too, and Though our being is unknown and unportrayed, our lyric worlds are yet in light and tone arrayed. The impulse toward creating cannot have an end. Unknowns, even while unbounded, further can befriend each other. Metaphoric worlds, in part opaque, through sibling love, unfathomed radiance will take. Your hidden treasure then, expend and never hoard, you thus will emulate the blessing of the Lord. One of the most remarkable things I found in Islamic legacy is the teaching of Ibn Arabi, the Sufi expositor. He says that all religions are uh, containers, cups, glasses, which give color and form to the water of spirit, but the container is not the water. And here's the thing that's equally wonderful about what he says. He looks at the Bible verse uh, in the, the, that tells us that uh, God created uh, humans in his own image. And he thinks about that and he says, if there's one thing that we know about God, it's that we know nothing about such a a supernal and transcendent being. Even the 99 names in, of God given in the Quran are not names, they're just rubrics of qualities. So uh, God is not knowable, he is the unknown. And if we're created in his likeness, we also are unknowable and unknown. So Socrates' oracle can say to him at the, in the temple at uh, Delphi, it can say, know thyself, but you can't do it. And that's the delightful thing about this teaching and about, I think, the truth that it points to in our nature. Namely, that as long as you live, you will be surprising yourself every day of your life. So what comes next? Next, oh, I'm always looking for different kinds of enlightenment. And here I found some from Walt Whitman. And it was part of my experience, uh, the kind of experience I love to tell about, of singing in a choir. I was singing in the uh, Binghamton University and Community Choir under the direction of the brilliant conductor William Culverhouse, and we were singing Dona Nobis Pacem, which despite the Latin title meaning Give Us Peace, is written entirely in English, and it's by Vaughan Williams, William Vaughan, uh, Ralph Vaughan, or Rafe, they say in England. Uh, Vaughan Williams is one of my all-time favorite composers, and uh, in Dona Nobis Pacem, he uses as lyrics for part of the piece uh, a hymn written by Walt Whitman, or, or a recollection. It's a 
uh, contemplative recollections, why I didn't know whether, whether or not to call it a hymn. And what he does is he explains how, at a memorial, he went up to the body of a dead Confederate soldier and kissed it, kissed the face of the Confederate, who was labeled his enemy, but there are no enemies. So here's my poem. It's called Peace. In reconciliation, that's the poem, Whitman's made to see the sisters death and night, who wash incessantly the world they cleanse from soilure. Motherly such care must, when I dreaming think of it, appear to me. The war and carnage we in sorrow scarcely bear will by that work at length be lost. A vision fair, most probably drawn near, because a brother love has lent the poet strength. The fighter lying there, he'll lightly touch with lips upon the face, and of the godliness they share when viewed from height above will be reminded. Called an enemy, one died. One lived. The love he showed forever may abide. To love my neighbor, heaven's gift of peace will bring. We're all of stardust made, and siblinghood may sing. Oh, let's have something lighter now. I just love to, to show you the changes of moods. From page to page, when, when you're um, riffling through this book, you will uh, enjoy watching it happen, how fast the moods alter. The uses that are made of this endlessly adaptable, endlessly applicable six-beat meter never stop. This is fascinating. This is called Bobo Roshi. It's also a kind of story of illumination like that of Walt Whitman, but also of a very different kind and of a highly unorthodox sort. This I, uh, the subtitle says, Widespread Narrative Convergently Retold on the Net by Philip Kaplow, Jan van de Wetering, and Alan Liu. Four different, or three different accounts uh, differing in no important detail. And so the, I call them convergent stories. This is a, a little poem of a non-tragic, in fact, quite amusing kind of enlightenment. This is a Zen monk, and he's been encountering some frustrations lately. Six years or ten, or, well, who knows how many, he, Satori, had been seeking daily and in vain. His koan poem reading seemed a pointless pain, a rolling, an annoyance, worthy, fervently. He sought in dream, a conquest even, while he slept in lotus turning, though by grumpy master chidden, till finally... By quickly rising impulse hidden, he mustered up his will and sudden overleapt the wall and to the willow quarter shortly came where, guileless, in a prudent manner none might blame, he gently answered when a silk-robed lady beckoned. And there the man exploded in satori, fecund beyond what he'd conceived before of halidom. I'd say, he came, he saw, and he was overcome. Well, for a, let's see, yes, I have time for a couple more. Uh, I would like to show you something utterly different. It's on the very next page. Uh, I have a friend named Annie Johnson who's an artist, a ceramist, a painter, and a sculptor in Owego, not far from where I live in Vestal, New York, upstate towns. And uh, she's not only a, a multi-arts person. Well, yes, this is art, an art also, the art of preparing delicious food. And uh, she sometimes writes me uh, about food preparation in an email, and then I make a poem out of it. This is called Pesto. A Lyrical Recipe January 14th, that's Bastille Day, 2012 You'll smell of lemon if you rub against 
the plant of lemon basil. With blue African, the blue, so rich, gets under fingernails, will stay there, too. The Genovese, the thickest, is the one you can't resist. The blender's good, but better yet, to chop the leaves. Sharp knife you need to cut and not to mash. A damaged leaf turns dark. The color shade on top is unattractive. Then you take the fragment cash and mold it to a little cake and add the nuts you've chopped and make it softer with a little oil. The texture varies from the chopping. That won't spoil a thing. It's tastier. Beware the knife. It cuts your nail if you're not careful. Then here's what you do. Just cover up the injured part with super glue. For my last poem, I'll turn to something a little more serious, p p perhaps because I, I had it in mind when planning to, to make it more memorable as being more consequent. This is poem 282, and it's called Dantescan. And that simply means, in the manner of Dante. <laughs> What's in the manner of Dante? Uh, I use his rhyme scheme. Uh, the, let's see. Well, A, B, A, B, C, B, C, D, C. Uh, ev the first, every third rhyme writes, uh, rhymes with the, the first example of it. And this is supposed to uh, uh, emblemize in the clearest way and in the most re uh, often re repeated, so unforgettable way, uh, the, the important, central importance to him of the Trinity doctrine. But simply taken as a rhyme scheme, it's very beautiful, uh, very melodious, and uh, uh, he used it for his divine comedy, the entire thing. Uh, hell, purgatory, and paradise. All three worlds are very different, and yet they're all here, aren't they? So here, here have been some of my recent thoughts, which I wrote up in what's going to be a concluding specimen in this short presentation, but it needn't be in any way con concluding uh, as you uh, experience the book yourself. If those whom great Apollo gifted with a lyre, or as I rather would imagine, violin, to raise the Orphic underworldly wonder higher with son filet, a golden thread, would boldened spin a fate-like spell by which the people closed their eyes, might listen, might listening like Saul to David's world within, as from an ode of Odin feel unruined rise a wind of peace, to win a spirit life, to plead an end to fears that mirror what they would despise. Then let me answer now our barren, weeping need by leaders harried who, disheartening in pride, dart snake-like venom enmity, might hearers heed a harmony and being fruitful sing, decried would hate flames die, and love, love would be glorified. 